Welcome, everyone, to the House Committee on Judiciary and Hawaiian Affairs. Our hearing today, Thursday, March 14th, 2024. It's just after 2 p.m. We're in Conference Room 325 here at the State Capitol, and we're also having this hearing by video conference. Uh, thank you, everyone, for being here today. Um, if you're testifying by uh, Zoom uh, and here in the room, if you could keep your testimony to two minutes, that'd be great. Uh, I'll ask you to summarize at that point. Um, if you're uh, testifying on Zoom, uh, please don't use any uh, copyrighted or uh, um, trademark images behind you because that kicks us off of YouTube and that's no good. Um, and uh, if you could, uh, if you need to talk to the technical staff, you can use the chat function that gets straight through to our excellent technical staff who can help you out. But please don't send me any messages because I don't hear them. Um, and uh, please keep yourself muted and your video turned off until you're called to testify. And at that point, after your testimony, if you could, again, mute yourself and turn your video off, that'd be great. Uh, I would ask uh, if everyone would just conduct themselves with aloha and, and no profanity or uncivil behavior. It's okay to disagree, but let's not be disagreeable. Uh, we're here to really help uh, the state of Hawaii and do what's best uh, for the, the people of Hawaii and our beautiful island state. Um, let's go ahead and focus on the agenda today. Our first bill is Senate Bill 2381, Senate Draft 2, relating to public financing for candidates to elected office. This measure establishes a comprehensive system of public financing for all candidates seeking election to state and county public offices in the state of Hawaii to begin with the 2028 general election year. Requires the Campaign Spending Commission to submit a progress and final report to the legislature. First up, we have Kristen Izumi Nitao, Executive Director, Campaign Spending Commission. Welcome. Please proceed. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chair, Vice Chair, members. Uh, I'm Kristen Izumi Nitao, Executive Director to the Campaign Spending Commission. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to testify. Um, as you know, the Commission is a single agency with only five staff members that regulates all candidates seeking election to state and county public offices, which translates to 128 elected offices. Um, further by law, it is the Hawaii Election Campaign Trust Fund that funds the public financing program. And right now, there's only $2 million in that trust fund. So while the commission appreciates the intent of this bill, it has strong concerns that this body has not committed the resources necessary for implementation and execution. This is a major, if not historic, campaign finance initiative, which the commission has always supported and, in fact, has been very cooperative in providing data and figures to all interested parties. However, from the very beginning, we have made it abundantly clear that a program of this magnitude requires funding and resources, which is why we are extremely disappointed to see that Senate Draft 2 has completely eliminated the funding, which includes the hiring of additional personnel and puts the Commission in an impossible position of ensuring and upholding the transparency and integrity of the campaign finance process. Uh, the details of our concerns and our proposed five amendments are set forth in our written testimony, so I will leave it at that and thank you for the opportunity to testify today, and of course I am available if you have any questions. Thank you very much. I appreciate your thorough testimony. Next we have Neil Herbert on Zoom from the Campaign Spending Commission. Oh, we'll come back to Mr. Herbert. Uh, we do have his written testimony, uh, and if uh, he comes back to active status, just let me know. Uh, next, we have Cameron Hurt, Common Cause. Welcome, sir. Please proceed. Thank you, Chair, members. Uh, we're going to stand on our written testimony as well, though, add um, that we acknowledge the concerns um, and that the bill as written would not go into effect immediately, which would give us time to seek funding and um, to find other revenue sources for funding. We also um, think that it is worth looking into the amendments offered by the um, elections commissions. We think there are some good amendments and if taken seriously, this program, yes, historic can still be done. It does take a lot to do something this big. This would be the largest um, endeavor of any state in the union currently. So yes, it would take a lot from us, but we are very much capable to do it. We, we may have to be, we will have to be, there's no may, we will definitely have to be creative and innovative in how we fund this, but there is money there to do it, and we are open for um, all recommendations and questions. 
Thank you. Thank you very much. Next, we have testimony from Evan Weber, Our Hawaii Action. Next, we have testimony from Hawaii Workers Center, Sergio Alcubila. Next, we have testimony from Maki Moranoe Huli Pack. Next, we is on Zoom. No. Nope. Next, we have testimony from Hope Services Hawaii, Kristen Ellis. No. Nope. Uh, testimony from Campaign Legal Center, Aaron McKean. Yes, please proceed. Yes, good afternoon, Chair, Vice Chair, and members of the committee. My name is Aaron McKean, and I'm legal counsel, senior legal counsel at Campaign Legal Center. Uh, we're a nonpartisan nonprofit uh, that works to advance democracy at every level of government. And we're strong supporters of public financing, uh, both across the country and in Hawaii, particularly with this program in SB 2381. Uh, and we I want to you know, just highlight three things for you know, making sure that this bill really does what it's supposed to be doing. Um, first, we want to reiterate exactly what um, Executive Director Natal had, Izumi Natal had uh, mentioned about funding and resources for running this program. We think that's a crucial part of establishing an effective public financing program. It's been shown across the country and others that you know being able to prepare for uh, you know, establishing such a program and running that program effectively, you do need permanent full-time staff and full funding to make sure it works. And then second, I also want to highlight that you know, we could amend this bill to provide supplemental funds for candidates. You know, in other versions of this kind of public financing program, like in Maine, uh, they found a lot of success by providing supplemental funds to candidates when they gather extra you know, qualifying contributions as they continue in their campaign. That helps them stay competitive through the end of the campaign and all the way through it. And then finally, I also want to highlight that you know, one way to, another way to improve the bill would be to allow certified candidates to pay their campaign debts before, uh, uh, I'm sorry, after the day of the, the, day of the election. Uh, the way the bill is structured right now, uh, it appears that a candidate would get to the day of the election, they wouldn't necessarily be able to pay off campaign debts that are remaining after that day, at least as the bill is worded at the moment. Uh, I've submitted written testimony with further uh, recommendations for strengthening the bill. Uh, we strongly support it, and I welcome any questions, uh, and would be happy to work with the committee. Thank you very much. Next, we have testimony from Dave Mullenix, Our Revolution Hawaii. Not present. Next, we have testimony from Nikos Leverens. Next, testimony from Chuck Friedman. Mr. Friedman, welcome. Good to see you, sir. Take your time. Take your time. I am an old timer. It's a long time since I've been here. The first time I testified in front of the House of Representatives, Tony Kunimoto was the chair of the Finance Committee, so that'll give you an idea. Welcome back. Yeah, welcome back, Cotter. Anyway, the, the, the point of me coming today, is, I would normally be in favor of anything that gives us clean elections and, and uh, better accountability. There, there is a problem with this legislation, and that's what we wanted to point out. The problem is that we suggest you consider ways to protect against the interference by super PACs and other entities like that in the case you go ahead and implement elections which are capped in the amount that a candidate can spend. Why am I saying this in, in contrast to uh, this proposed law is that if you are capped by uh, how much you could spend and, a, and the super, a super PAC decided I can, I can get those guys for a, for a cheap dollar um, it, will, it will open up, I think, unfairness where you're trying to create fairness. One hypothetical example. Uh, last uh, campaign season, Be Change Now, uh, a union organization, dark, or, dark money organization, spent over $3 million to campaign against uh, Lieutenant Governor candidate and, um, and for another because they just didn't like her. And if you took that amount of money, $3.2 million, and let's say you try to divide it over 
five council, Honolulu Council seats. Five seats would give you uh, a majority, and you uh, allowed a super PAC to campaign against candidates who were constrained by public financing, they could use their undue influence to get a majority of the city council and perhaps move ahead with their ideas, which are not in keeping with the public, such as large development or whatever it is that's not uh, commonly accepted today. So we think that there are things that you, you can do and should do, not just the legislature, but other bodies in this community to protect against what are really the evils of uh, dark money and super PACs. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, next, we have testimony from Jonah Minkoff Zern. Not present. Not present. Next, uh, testimony from Stephanie Maldonado. And next, testimony from Kencho Gurung. Testimony from Jasmine on Zoom, not present. Uh, testimony from Philili Mendoza on Zoom. And testimony from Keani Rollins Fernandez on Zoom. Please proceed. Aloha, e, Chair Tarnas, uh, Vice Chair Takayama, and Honorable Committee members. I'm Councilmember Kiani Rollins Fernandez. Mahalo for this opportunity to testify in strong support of SB 2381, which would establish a comprehensive system of pu public financing for all candidates seeking election. Mahalo to the previous committee that incorporated the amendments that were requested. I support this measure because I support representative democracy, a government of, for, and by the people. For government to truly represent the people, it is absolutely imperative that we all vote in elections. It is equally important to ensure that people have good candidates to vote for, candidates who they feel would represent their interests in decision making, candidates who are accessible and responsive to them. As folks in Maui County reach out to our legislators, particularly those who have been impacted by the devastating fires, it is more important than ever we have legislators who are working alongside the community. There are so many competing interests and conflicting interests that can afford to donate the maximum allowed to candidates that may not prioritize the interests of the everyday community member and who can compensate others in leadership positions to donate the maximum allowed. Community members in general cannot compete with this level of funding, which often translates to a weaker voice, especially community members who make minimum wage or close to it. It's important that when we recognize systems of oppression, which is what the decision in Citizens United created, we counter it by building systems that empower and uplift our everyday community members. While I wish this program had been established before the fires occurred, we are here now and we have the opportunity to establish it this year. And while I wish it would be fully funded this, um, this year, I can support taking the first step of establishing it. For this year, the decision before you is whether this program is worthwhile to institute, and I strongly believe it is. The decision on how much funding should be allocated to this program is a decision for another day. I support the Campaign Spending Commission's request for resourcing. In this first year, after funding the position to manage the program, perhaps it would be useful to poll the, this year's candidates to find out how many would be interested in participating in a program like this. In Maui County, we have taken this approach multiple times, establishing a program before it's made available to applicants, giving agencies time to prepare for the important task ahead. This approach has served us well in collecting necessary information and taking the next steps. Mahalo to all of you for, for working hard to serve the people. Mahalo Rep Miyake for representing the people of Maui. Please pass this measure today. Aloha. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Weber, I called you earlier and you weren't here. I thought you guys moved. Today. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, yeah, uh, Kalamai and Oha Kako, uh, Evan Weber with Ar Hawaii. Um, we're a member of the Clean Elections Coalition, which is in strong support of this bill. Um, I mostly will stand on my written testimony. Um, I did want to take a moment just to respond to the one person who spoke in opposition um, to the bill. I agree deeply that um, the problem presented by super PAC and dark money and uh, unlimited spending is a major problem here in our democracy. Um, unfortunately, for a whole host of reasons, as this committee is well aware, uh, we are not uh, acting as the sovereign nation of Hawaii, uh, and we are 
bound by the decisions of the U.S. Supreme Court, um, which in Citizens United said that that was okay. And so what this legislation does is it really addresses the question of money in politics um, as far as would be allowed by the U.S. Supreme Court and the U.S. Constitution, doing what we can here to give folks the option of an alternative to um, running on private campaign dollars. I'd love for us to continue to come up with creative ways to deal um, with that problem of dark money as this committee and others have tried to um, and, and hopefully will continue to, but this is taking one important step forward. It's not a be-all, end-all solution, but I think that it will be a transformative. And um, <clears throat> the other thing that I just want to lift up from my testimony, um, uh, the Clean Elections Hawaii Coalition released some uh, poll numbers uh, this week um, by a reputable firm, one of the best in the nation, that show that we have a really serious problem here on our hands um, as it relates to um, public perception of what's going on here in this building. Unfortunately, two out of three, um, you know, I'm going to just share some hard truths. If you haven't taken a look at the polling yet or saw it in the testimony, two out of three voters believe that uh, legislators in this building care more about wealthy donors um, than they do about the needs of our communities. And so... You can summarize, please. Yes. Whether, whether you, you, you believe that's fair or not, it's important to know that that is how the public feels right now, and this legislation, also supported by over two-thirds of voters, would be an important signal to send uh, to show that we're taking this problem seriously and continuing to move forward after the corruption scandals that have shaken all of our consciousness in recent years. Mahalo Nui for your time. Thank you. That's all the... Ah, <clears throat> uh, let's uh, go back to Mr. Neil Herbert on Zoom. Please proceed with your testimony. Okay, there we go. Thank you, uh, Chairman uh, Tarnas and uh, Vice Chair and the committee for uh, allowing me this opportunity to comment on the bill. Um, much of the new legislation on campaign funding reform passed last year was the result of CSC's, the Campaign Spending, Spending Commission's input, including the critically acclaimed special study done by the commission to improve standards of conduct established in 2022 by House Resolution Number 9 to improve standards of conduct. Our Executive Director, Kristen Izumi Natao, was a member of this uh, committee, the Special Committee, and these new laws and the pending bills to convert, like this one here, to full public financing will dramatically increase administrative responsibilities. With only five staff currently authorized, it's the same number since its start in 1975. It's been very difficult to maintain the high standards of service expected by the public. Two administrative positions were vacant for months, and difficulties in hiring qualified replacements put a significant extra burden on remaining staff who had to fill in during these personnel shortages, in addition to their normal responsibilities, all with significant unpaid overtime. We are well aware of and understand the fiscal bill tightening needed to prioritize assistance to Maui after the Lahaina disaster and the effect it no doubt has on the state funding across the board. However, the Campaign Spending Commission is just one of the few entities that actually brings money into state coffers. Over the past four years, over $288,000 has been collected from fines and placed in the general fund. Meanwhile, the staff's operating budget has only increased by just under $30,000 in that same time span. Surely these should be factors offsetting the $200,000 for the two new positions being requested. Even one additional position would greatly help. The CSC regularly receives praise from candidates and the general public for its efficiency, integrity, responsiveness, and unbiased procedures often mentioned as an example for other commissions to follow. Let's please keep it this way with some legislative and budgetary assistance. And I am the chair, current chair of the Campaign Spending Commission. Thank you. Thank you very much. Is there anyone else wishing to testify on this measure? Please come on up and introduce yourself. Careful. Good afternoon, Chair, Vice Chair, 
Members of this committee, my name is Sergio Alcabilia. I'm the executive director of the Hawaii Worker Center. I apologize. Uh, sorry, uh, I called you earlier. Miss, uh, missed you. Yes, Chair. I, my apologies. No worries. I Go ahead. Um, you know, we stand in strong support of this of this bill. The Hawaii Worker Center is a nonprofit organization that have, envisions a Hawaii in which all workers are empowered to exercise their right to organize for their own political, economic, and social well-being. So usually what happens when workers begin to organize is, of course, the corporate interests will begin to call in favors and will begin to circle their allies, whether it's you know, in our halls of our Congress, from our state legislatures, to our city halls. This bill, for us, is, it gives workers a fighting chance. You know, I call this bill um, pay to play the people's way. You know, because now it actually gives working class people, everyday people like you and me, a chance to actually be uh, a, particip uh, a participant in our, in our politics. Just so, as a, on a personal level, you know, I had this crazy dream a few years ago that I was going to stand up against corporate interests and run for office myself. I, I was a relatively unknown, really no political experience, but I said, hey, I, you know, we need someone to stand up um, to some of these corporate interests. You know, our campaign took a stand not to accept uh, corporate-backed donations, and of course it was hard. And I think of the people that supported our campaign. A lot of them were, um, you know, single parents. A lot of them were workers working two or three jobs. And, you know, sometimes I, I pull back, you know, I collect some of their letters that they send me. And this, this one letter says, I'm a low-income boomer widow, but I found some extra money to send you to show that I believe in you. Please take care, stay safe, live long and prosper. Much aloha to you. You know, a lot of times when we make donations to campaigns, a lot of it is for access, you know, just access to our legislature, le legislators. There's some people that, you know, make donations because they believe in the candidate. And I have utmost respect for all our elected officials because you've been through the grind. You know, you've been out there campaigning. You've made those hard fundraising calls. When you call random people, they, don't, they have no idea who you are, but you're asking them for their hard-earned money. So really, uh, I respect that. But... You know, at the same time, you know, we need to give our workers a fighting chance when it comes to our politics, that their voice can also be heard, and not just our politics doesn't just belong to those with power and to those with money, but it belongs to everyday people. And I thank you again, uh, Chair, for allowing me to testify and members of this committee. Certainly. Thank you very much for your testimony. Is there anyone else wishing to testify on Senate Bill 2381? If not, questions, members? Representative Linda Ichiyama. Chair, I have questions for Campaign Spending Commission, please. Hi. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you very much for being here. Sure. Um, I was wondering uh, for the um, amounts that were uh, given for each office um, that will be used or should, I should say should be given to each candidate, um, those are also the spending caps. Is that correct? Yes. That would be the spending cap. And how, how was that determined? Um, I think it's based on the formula that was proposed in the um, in the bill. Um, so, as you probably know, this is not our bill. This is a bill that was, uh, of course, you know, introduced by Senator Rhodes, and uh, we did provide data based upon prior elections as to what it takes to win an election. So, it is grounded in real data, but I don't, I can't speak to how the formula was proposed. It, and how it operates. Is there any relation to our current partial public finance no. limits? No, not a relation at all. Okay. I was just curious because the amount for OHA, which is a statewide, um, for certain seats, I'm sorry, island-wide, mm -hmm. I should say, in the at-large seats, is it determined correctly? Um, anyway, it just seemed very low for the OHA candidates. Um, are you speaking about this, the comprehensive public funding or the partial public funding? The comprehensive public funding. In I this see. Bill, the, the limit is 40000 total for both the primary and the general. I don't know if you could speak to why it's No, so I can't. Low. Sorry. I wish I could speak to that. Um, again, it's, if, if that is a figure that brings concern, particularly if you look at past... Um, amounts that it took to win these elections, we certainly would take another look at it. Um, as I mentioned, these are just figures as proposed by the author of the bill for which we, uh, you know, provided. And then my, um, it's okay, Chair, I have a couple certainly. more questions. 
Um, it doesn't have a process for what happens, like let's say you, the, the $30 million runs out, right? Because there had to be a minimum of 30 in order for the program to go forward and you would post a notice. So what happens if that 30 gets committed? If it runs out, it runs while out. we're executing, yeah. um, then we wouldn't have any money <laughs> to execute it. We'd be capped. So it would so, be like a first come, first serve? I think it would have to be. I mean, if there's no money to administer, there's no money. So yeah, for sure, we could run out. But I mean, there is a, you know, a, a verification process because in order for a candidate to qualify for the public funds, they have to raise a certain amount of minimum qualifying contributions. <laughs> So that piece in and of itself is extraordinary because we're talking about 50 to over $6,000 cash contributions depending on which elected office. And that type of verification process is, um, I think has tremendous fiduciary duties, you know, audit and investigative and enforcement, a lot of duties that's attached to that to ensure that that person truly qualifies for the public funding. Um, but. You know, it's, yeah, I think if the 30 million runs out, the 30 million runs out unless the legislature puts more money within the trust fund. But um, the current bill speaks to, well, actually there's no money in the current bill, but it, it, the original version spoke to a 30 million, yes. Okay, and then the city clerk had some concerns in their testimony about they're the ones being asked to do the verification, exactly as you just referred to, of the thousands of $5 contributions they're asking that that be placed with the Campaign Spending Commission. Do you have any thoughts on that? So, um, you know, I have to, um, so when Senate Draft 1 came out, it required that there be, um, that the commission look at um, physical and electronic verification. And when we saw that modification, that amendment in Senate Draft 1 of this bill, um, it caused us some pause and thought, we, and we, we informed the county clerks too, that they're in the better position. They have the databases for specifically electronic signatures, which is what some of the testifiers wanted when we had this um, within uh, the Senate Judiciary. Um, so with that modification, we recommended that. Um, but I wanna say that if the county clerks um, are believe that we would have access to that database, which I don't know, we, it, that would allow us verification. Um, that would be a step in the right direction, I suppose. But right now, we don't have those tools. We can't verify. We have no idea who is a resident of what district. That's within the county clerks. Um, we can certainly work with them, but there is a, a, an abbreviated time period on this. Um, I would also add that the verification process does not end with that. That's just a verification that that $5 contribution came from a resident within the jurisdiction or district, if applicable, in a, um, uh, um, in, in, uh, for an elected position, in, in contrast to statewide. Um, we would still, the commission still would have m many other duties besides that um, to verify that $5 contribution in and of itself what is, um, is legitimate and not fraudulent before we turn over and um, authorize the rest of that money. So it doesn't begin and end with the county clerks. Um, it was merely a suggestion, I suppose, that we have not fully engaged with the county clerks I'm aware of their testimony. I have not um, had a chance to engage with them other than informing them after Senate Draft 1 came down our recommendation that they, that since they have the materials and the tools, that they verify at least the resident contribution. But yes, if this bill continues, we do need to meet with them and figure out how this would happen. I'm also kind of concerned about the short timeline of yeah. to verify 10 days. I know. Right, and yeah. you have a deadline, I think it's 30 days before the primary election when Correct. people can apply to get certified. Correct. So theoretically, you could have hundreds of candidates at your door Correct. with thousands. Correct. Of in, a, in a 2028 election, that is similar to this year, it's a mayoral election, and we have typically, um, I think, 103, 110 <laughs> 
um, candidates, um, I mean, excuse me, uh, seats. And you can imagine that could be anywhere from two, one to, I don't know how many candidates could be running for that position. And if they all qualify, you can imagine the magnitude of that type of um, the money that would, or excuse me, I guess the verification process at the unit for the first step. And so that leads me, I think, to your original point about staffing and mm -hmm. you would need to stand up this, this type of system that I think you would need sooner rather than later yeah. to work out these kinds of implementation questions. But I also have to ask, you know, if this bill were to stay the way it is, I think you need more people, actually. <laughs> well, the, 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 again, the authors of the bill put in two, and um, to be very transparent, you know, I've been seeing the writing on the wall with the increased number of, of committees that have registered with this, uh, with the commission, which has increased over time. And um, I, I, you know, I, I can't thank my staff enough for doing what they do. Um, and trying to find innovative ways, and they do so so graciously with kindness, I think, in trying to help candidates and committees, because I, I think we all believe at the end of the day it's better if we can get compliance than enforcement. But I think I can see it's, we're fully tapped, um, and this is a vehicle for which uh, the authors of it had provided for two uh, positions. Um, so from, from that um, launching pad, we are explaining why we need those positions. And of course, it's a, it's a huge program, and I would, I'm advocating to have the positions now, not only for our current duties, but this kind of program, I mean, I feel a, a strong fiduciary duty to the public that it be administered properly and transparently and with integrity. Uh, we're going to need rules, we're going to need new forms, we're going to need to boost our electronic filing system. Um, every year in every election, we have oh, sometimes up to 150 new candidates. Now, this kind of program is going to increase that, and it's these new candidates, perhaps not so much this, the members of this committee who are very seasoned, but if you're a new candidate, it's a very, very, very um, steep learning curve. And again, we're here to help, but we need the time to build the program for this, for this kind of um, comprehensive programming. So yes, it's 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 and so we you know we do training. We want to do education. We have to build the we have to build the um, electronic filing system. We have to boost our forms. We have to do rulemaking, which you know takes at least two years to do. Um, so we would hit the ground running. We are excited for this program. I think it really would put Hawaii in an epic position. Uh, so we don't dispute that. But again. You know, we want it to be a successful program, and I don't think the bill as it stands now is building it towards success, which is why we're here to testify. Can I ask one more question, Chair? Certainly. You know, I think um, one of the testifiers raised very valid concerns about the role of independent expenditures and PACs. Mm -hmm. I don't see anything in this bill that would address that or limit that. Is that correct? Uh, well, this bill, the, the, I think the attractive feature of this bill is it would prevent a candidate who receives full public funds from receiving any private donations, or at least they can't spend that. It would be frozen in their accounts. So in other words, if you are a comprehensive public funder, all you're going to do is spend those monies that you get. You can't accept private donations. That is the difference between this and the partial public funding program, which has expenditure well, caps, but it still permits quite my question, oh. is that, right, um, let's say uh, two people are in a race and both mm -hmm. of them, uh, they're the only people in the race and both of them accepted, you know, participated in this full public financing, so you're correct. Both of those candidates would not be able to accept any PAC donations. But I don't see anything in this bill, and I'm not sure if we could, but there's nothing to prohibit a PAC from dumping hundreds of thousands of dollars. Independently, independently to support. Independently mm -hmm. to support one of those candidates. Is that correct? I'd have to take another look at that. I don't know if I have seen that. I don't. I don't see anything in the current draft that would say anything about that. So while we may hmm. be saying the candidates themselves are not accepting these PAC donations and spending money, but yeah. an outside third I party could totally legitimately. Of mm -hmm. I hear what you're saying. Into that race. I hear what you're saying. I would have to take a look, another look at the bill. I don't know if somebody in uh, 
present at this hearing has a response to that. Um, but I, I totally appreciate your, your question. Okay, thank yeah. you. Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. Other questions? Representative Gannadin. Uh, to Mr. Weber. Good afternoon. Your organization has been pretty active in advocating for this bill this year and last year. Sure. Um, it's a long one. Can you describe to the committee um, any differences, if there are any, from this year and th this bill that we have before us and the one that we reviewed last year? Yeah, um, that's a great question. So to, this will speak to some of uh, Representative Ichiyama's questions as well. Um, uh, one of the big changes um, that I can speak to is that the uh, funding numbers were updated last year based on feedback that was received. Um, I don't know the full details of the formula, but I can share a little bit more. Um, like, um, <laughs> like the CSC director shared, um, it's a based off of the average of spending in past races for that election and what it took to win. Um, I think it's based on the previous three election cycles is how the numbers of funds were set. So the numbers were updated to include 2022, um, and they better accurately reflect what it takes to win, let's say, an OHA seat or a Maui County Council seat, um, for example. Um, the other big change was um, that there was um, something put in to deal with the issue that you raised about what, what happens when the funds run out and the first come first serve is something that Rep Tarnas um, raised some valid concerns about last session as well. Um, and then last but not least, um, there was also um, a, th th there's no uh, funding allocated to the bill uh, for the actual uh, spending. It's just to establish the program, hopefully um, staff up the campaign spending commission and allow them to begin doing the work and then a future legislature would have to allocate that 30 million or more uh, to allow candidates to actually participate. Uh, to follow up on that, um, and to follow up on Representative Ichiyama's question, uh, let's say a candidate um, went through the program, um, received public funding, was capped. That wouldn't preclude, say, a union or um, a 501c5 organization from endorsing them, but then not giving them money. Is that correct? That is correct to my understanding of both the uh, bill as it's written and what the current law is. Now, the question of super PACs is a separate question. I tried to address that um, in my comments. Uh, what was your name again? Sorry. Chuck. Chuck's, Chuck's absolutely right with the problem that he's raising. I want to be clear. I'm not trying to say that super PACs are not a problem. This legislation can't do anything about that because we are bound by the Supreme Court and Citizens United decision that they made, which says super PACs can run wild, <laughs> basically. So um, this would still, this, this, the legislation doesn't do anything to address super PACs because anytime any state body anywhere in the country has tried to pass legislation to address super PACs, including this one, they have been struck down by the Supreme Court. Um, so until the US Congress or the Supreme Court changes their tune as relates to the Citizens United, this is an important step that we can take to at least provide candidates an ability to have an even playing field if they don't have the same access to the kinds of donors um, that, um, that, that other people have found access to. Uh, and you know, it's important to note that UH Manoa uh, in their study of these kinds of programs around uh, the country as they exist in Connecticut, Maine, Arizona, elsewhere, greatly their biggest impact is increasing the number of uh, minority communities, women, working class people, young people in office, and I think that's something that hopefully we would all welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Other questions, you. members? If not, I have a question uh, for uh, Director of Campaign Spending Commission. Kristen Izumi Nitao, uh, thank you so much for your testimony. It, it's uh, very concerning. Uh, the way I, uh, if I understand it correctly, you're um, you know, basically the, you're saying that we would be, well, I was just using your words, it's CSC would be in an impossible position of ensuring and upholding the transparency and integrity of the campaign finance process 
in this historic piece of campaign reform. And that's without any of the funding and positions that you need. Uh, it, you're, this bill really does not, as it is now, will not set us on the path for a successful program. I mean, I'm just, is that accurate in how you <coughs> have assessed the impact of this particular Senate draft too? As it stands right now, yeah. I mean, if you if you want to look, there's no funding in there for it. Um, I realize it's a 2028 election, so it'd be difficult to put an appropriation. Hence, our recommendation that there's some commitment that there's um, it would be um, appropriated in in time for the 2028 election. Um, right now, the reality is there's only two million in the trust fund. That's not enough for this type of program. Um, and, you know, if, if it's revisited for the 2028 election, and at that point, let's just say um, they, they permit staffing with the commission, it might be just way too much too late. I mean, to get, I, I just can't, I just worry about, you know, being responsible for that kind of money and administering it responsibly um, without programming in place. I think that's why I, I'm saying I, I just, as it stands, it would be very difficult. Um, I'm just, you know, in a rock and a hard place because I, I can appreciate the spirit of what this is doing, but from the very beginning, um, I've been, we've been very open about you need to fund it and you need to have the resources to be able to administer it. And you're estimating it would take you at least a couple of years to get ready for this. Yes, and um, you know, this is, I will say this, we did have the Hawaii County Council Comprehensive Public Funding Program. That was in 2010 and 2012, and this legislature made it a pilot program. So it, I guess it was Act 244 was signed July 8th, 2008, and it went into effect one year later. So we had to be ready for it by September 1st, 2009, and this was predates me, but that was only nine seats and we had less than a year. This is, like I said, at least 103 seats, and in a gubernatorial election two years later, it's 100, at least 130 seats, and, and you know, you, give or take. Um, and it's, you know, as Representative Ichiyama said, is I'm just guessing, you know, I don't know, we never know who's gonna qualify for this kind of funding. But I can see that it's very attractive, as it's supposed to be, that you're gonna have candidates that are gonna require some hand-holding because as you all know, it's an electronic filing system and I can see my staff already who's tapped even in every election helping particularly new candidates. And this is gonna, I mean, again, I, I, have, I have no doubt it's gonna raise um, you know, a lot of interest, but we have to do it the right way and the responsible way. So when you say you're current staff is tapped. You're saying they're already stretched too thin. To We're already stretched some, too thin. Yeah. Some other metaphor or something. Tap meaning that they're, they're maxing out on their efforts to be able to meet current requirements. And this would be, well, a lot more responsibilities to add on top of to your current requirements. Yes. Um, I mean, just, just putting a little, um, you know, pinpointing today, there's uh, 433 registered candidate committees right now and 253 registered non-candidate committees, of which 19 are super PACs. Um, right now, um, that's what we're looking at going into this election. Um, and with something like this, um, I think, you know, if we're gonna start building towards this, we, you know, we're gonna have to accommodate um, time to build this program in addition to holding not only this election, and potentially another election in Maui, um, if you build up that Lele community um, district. Um, but, but of course, we'll have a gubernatorial one, and this will be a mayoral one, and the next one will be a gubernatorial one, and then this was gonna hit. So it's not like we're at a standstill. We have to have ongoing operations and build towards this program. Yeah. I'm just concerned this is setting us up for failure with the current draft of this bill. Well, I appreciate your testimony. Thank, Thank you. you. Mr. Thank you Hurt. Questions. You had mentioned in your testimony that there would be other sources of funding. What, what are you thinking about? I was encouraging the legislature to diversify um, 
other sources of funding. I didn't make a recommendation for what that could look like, but... You're uh, talking about private funding? What are you talking about? No, I'm talking about funding the program, because as of right now, as was just stated, we only have $2 million, well, you're, you're and we got to get to $30 million. other public funding that could be provided? I'm saying that to get to the $30 million, we are going to have to be creative and think of outside the box as to where that revenue stream can come from if we're still looking at a 2028 date and thinking out in the future. Right. So past now and then over the next year or year and a half to find where that next, uh, where the funding can come from is what I was speaking to. Okay. But just so I'm clear, you're, you're referring to uh, state funding? Yes, sir. Got it. Okay. Not private funding. No, okay. sir. Thank you. Um, Councilwoman Rollins Fernandez, are you still online there? I have a question for you, if you're available. Um, oh, Aloha Church, yes. I appreciate your uh, support for this. There are some members that I've talked to about this that are saying, well, why is it that the state should pay for county, or for candidates running for county races? The counties should pay for this. Uh, do you think that there is an appetite within the county of Maui to pay for the publicly uh, financed elections for candidates running for county office in Maui County? Mahalo for the question, Chair Tonis. Um, I, just as the partial funding um, program is funded by the state, um, I would assume that it would run in the same way. No, I understand. I'm just saying that there are many members of the House that are saying that they don't want the state to pay for candidates running for county office. And I was just curious if you thought that the county of Maui would be willing to pay for uh, the campaigns of candidates running for office, like Maui County Council, Maui Mayor, et cetera. Mahalo. I guess as counties, we're subdivisions of the state, and so we're an extension of the state's kuleana. Um, if there's an appetite, uh, I. I guess I shouldn't speak on behalf of the county. I haven't asked our specific county. I know right now, after the fires, uh, <laughs> funding is tight. Understood. Yeah, I, I appreciate that. And I'm just trying to respond to questions that I've gotten from members within the House, and they're saying the county should be paying for county candidates. And I was just curious what you thought about that. But well, thank you. I appreciate your candid response. Mahalo Shatanis. Okay, um, those are all my questions. Any other questions, members? Okay, if not, thank you very much to all the testifiers on this. Let's move on to the next measure. Senate Bill 3243, <coughs> Senate Draft 1, relating to campaign finance. This measure prohibits foreign entities and foreign-influenced business entities from making contributions, expenditures, electioneering communications, or donations for election purposes requires every business entity that contributes or expends funds in a state election to file a statement of certification regarding its limited foreign influence, requires non-candidate committees making only independent expenditures to obtain a statement of certification from each top contributor required to be listed in an advertisement. On this measure, we have first up uh, the Campaign Spending Commission. Oh, thank you, Chair, Vice Chair, members. Um, you know, I'm going to stand on our written testimony and, of course, be available uh, for any questions. Okay, thanks. Uh, is Gary Cam on Zoom? No, no, he's not. Okay, didn't know if he was uh, joining us, as was indicated in the uh, the list. Um, uh, I usually ask testifiers to highlight your testimony, but I, I'm I'm thinking that you may not want to do that. <laughs> You want to highlight any of the, the main sure, points sure. of your testimony? Sure. I can, I can testify that, you know, we support the intent of the bill. I think our only main comment has to do with there has been some litigation on this issue. Um, so we would uh, recommend that you, uh, that this committee consult with the Department of the Attorney General due to any constitutional concerns um, due to um, First Amendment concerns but we do support the intent. And so your concern from your testimony, if I just want to make sure I understand, the extent this bill expands the foreign national contribution and expenditure ban derived from the federal uh, uh, act that you were referring to, 
to also ban contributions and expenditures by foreign-influenced business entities. The Commission is concerned that the bill raises serious First Amendment uh, and FECA preemption concerns. So it's really the foreign-influenced business entity uh, uh, reference that is concerning to you. Yes, and, and, and how it's defined as to what percentages of that mm -hmm. are permitted. Um, you know, again, we can appreciate the spirit of the bill, and we would, you know, um, fully state that contributions uh, from foreign nationals and foreign contributions is banned. Right. Um, our only other comment is that the farther we departure from FICA, the less guidance we have on um, on, uh, on on legal liabilities. Um, but this is an area for which there is um, um, interest within the, you know, other, um, in other states. It's just that I think it's just being litigated. So it's just something to be aware of. Uh, understood. And just for those who are listening or watching, FICA is the Federal Election Campaign Act. Sorry, which is yes. a federal act that uh, governs, uh, that bans contributions from foreign nationals. Correct. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you Thank very you. much for your testimony. Next we have testimony in support from the League of Women Voters of Hawaii, testimony in support from ILW Local 142, testimony in support from Ronald Andrew Fine, F-E-I-N. Please proceed, sir. Yes, uh, thank you, uh, Chair, Vice Chair, Committee Members. I'm Ron Fine. I'm the Legal Director of Free Speech for People, and we're a national nonpartisan nonprofit organization that works to reform campaign financing. Uh, in support of SB 3243, which bans corporate political spending by foreign-influenced business entities. I submitted uh, extensive written testimony, but I'll just make a few brief points here. Uh, first, this bill is constitutional uh, and explained that uh, in, in detail in the written testimony, but the summary is that the U.S. Supreme Court in a decision after Citizens United called Blumen versus Federal Election Commission has approved banning campaign spending from foreign entities based on the interest in protecting democratic self-government. This bill extends that to businesses where those foreign entities exercise influence. Uh, the Campaign uh, Spending Committee uh, Commission's um, executive director just uh, mentioned litigation uh, pending in Minnesota. Uh, in the Minnesota case, uh, the court rejected the argument that a similar bill was preempted by FICA, but did grant a temporary injunction pending full litigation citing Citizens United, and we're actually in communication with the state attorney general's office there. They are vigorously defending it on the merits. They're in the middle of the trial preparation phase uh, right now, so it's still uh, an ongoing uh, case there. <coughs> Uh, second quick point, the foreign ownership thresholds in this bill correspond to substantial influence in corporate decision making. Uh, and I've uh, attached to my uh, testimony uh, in this bill uh, that of a former general counsel of the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission who uh, wrote testimony on a very similar bill that's pending in California. And that's at the end of my testimony. Third quick point, this bill is workable. It puts the burden of compliance on the corporations themselves not the Campaign Spending Commission. And last point, uh, there was discussion for the previous bill about super PACs. Now, this bill will not end super PACs uh, as a class, but it specifically bans a foreign-influenced business entity from making a contribution to a super PAC, which will have the effect of drying up a, a lot of, though not all of, super PACs funding. Thank you, and I'd be pleased to answer any questions you may have. Thank you very much. Next, we have testimonies uh, from Nikos Leverins. Then testimony from three individuals. Is there anyone else wishing to testify in Senate Bill 3243? If not, questions, members? Seeing none, thank you very much. We're going to move on. Senate Bill 2405, relating to campaign finance. This measure allows an election candidate, treasurer, or candidate committee to use campaign funds for the candidate's child care and vital household dependent care costs under certain conditions. On this measure, we have Campaign Spending Commission. Good afternoon, Chair, Vice Chair members, Kristen Izumi Nitao, Executive Director, Campaign Spending Commission. Um, we are supporting this bill. Um, 
Um, this bill has come before this body a few times before. It's always been our position that uh, we don't believe it to be necessary because we can appreciate how that this is a um, expense that is directly related to the candidate's campaign and thus permissible. Um, but we can also acknowledge that there's been a movement to make this part of a statutory um, uh, permitted uh, expenditure under 11-381, and therefore we we would support it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next, uh, Cameron Hurt, Common Cause. Welcome. Please proceed. Thank you, Chair. Um, Cameron Hurt, Common Cause Hawaii. Uh, pretty much standing on my testimony as is, do I do want to highlight that uh, this would really just be falling in line with the rest of the nation with already 35 states having this. Um, that's more than half of the states. And as a personal note, as a political scientist, single father, um, I can see how this would be very impactful for somebody. And again, this is a trend that is going across our country, um, not just here in the state of Hawaii. Uh, so Common Cause strongly supports this bill. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have testimony from Becky Gardner, Democratic Party of Hawaii Women's Caucus. Next, we have testimony and support from Vote Mama Foundation, Louisa Duggan. Dugan. Please Dugan. proceed. Thank you so much. Good afternoon. My name is Louisa Dugan, and I'm submitting testimony on behalf of Vote Mama Foundation in strong support of Senate Bill 2405. It is an honor and a privilege to be providing testimony today on a piece of legislation that would benefit everyday caregivers throughout my home state. Child care obligations are one of the major factors families consider when weighing their decision to run for office. In many states, it costs more to send an infant to child care than to complete a mortgage payment. This is not an expense working families can take on, especially when campaigning. By passing Senate Bill 2405 into law, the Hawaii State Legislature has the opportunity to strengthen access to democracy for working families. Addressing the structural barriers like the cost of child care that prohibit caregivers from running for and serving in office furthers our notions of good governance and equality. This legislation would advance public trust in how candidates can and do use their campaign funds on expenses directly related to campaign activities. Vote Mama Foundation is the only organization working to expand and codify the use of campaign funds for child care in all 50 states. In 2018, the Federal Election Commission approved federal candidates' option to spend campaign funds on child care through a unanimous bipartisan vote. This paved the way for all federal candidates to do so as well. Subsequently, 31 states, both Democratic and Republican, have brought their state statutes in line with federal regulations. States like Arkansas, California, Washington, and West Virginia all allow for candidates to use their campaign dollars on caregiving expenses. This legislation is a bipartisan initiative for moms and dads alike. As with any other campaign finance allowance, this bill creates an option for use and is not a mandate. Candidates do not have to use campaign funds on caregiving expenses that they do not want to. Even better, this common sense solution is at no cost to taxpayers. Lastly, I'll, I'll wrap up shortly. I'm thrilled to share that just in January of 2024, we released our latest report that outlines the usage of campaign funds spent on child care expenses at both the federal and state level since 2018. And our research revealed that since 2018, campaign funds for child care spending has increased by over 600% by federal candidates and by over 2,000% for state and local candidates in states where it's authorized. The majority of federal funds were spent by women, at the federal level, 46% of funds were spent by candidates of color, and at the state and local level, 70% of funds were spent by candidates of color. Thank you for your time and consideration. I respectfully ask the House Judiciary and Hawaiian Affairs Committee to support Senate Bill 2405 and vote it out of committee. I'm available for questions. Thank, Thank you, so you very much. much. Uh, next, we have testimony support from Nikos Leverens. Uh, that's all we've had signed up to testify. Is there anyone else wishing to testify in this measure? Please come on up and introduce yourself. Chair, Vice Chair, members of the committee, my name is Yang Yeovoli, and I'm the public policy ah, chair yes. for AAUW. I was able to rearrange my meeting to Thank be you. here in person. Yeah, I saw you submitted your testimony. We've shared it with members. I didn't know you were going to be here. So welcome. Yeah, thank you. Please thank proceed. you for this opportunity. So Louisa mentioned some of the things that's in my testimony, and so did Cameron, so I'm not going to repeat those. Only addition I will make is uh, when I talk to moms who are very promising leader, uh, this comes up. Not having resource for childcare comes up as one of the primary reasons why they cannot run. 
And the data shows that 17.6% um, of uh, population are moms with uh, kids under 18, but only 6.58% of state legislators in Hawaii are moms with kids under 18. So they are really underrepresented. So by, I know that you, and I want to thank CSC for uh, your support, and I know you have been supportive before. Uh, so I will ask that you continue to support this measure. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. Anyone else wishing to testify on this measure? If not, questions, members? Vice Chair Takayama. A question for campaign spending, if I would, if I could, please. Yeah. Um, in your testimony, you said that child care expenses could, under current law, already be considered a legitimate uh, campaign expense, is that right? Correct, is directly related. Um, would that also be extended, could that also be extended to the opposite end where um, a candidate might be a, a family caregiver for an elderly parent who yes. might be suffering from an um, illness? Yes, because it would apply to the vital household dependent care. Okay, all right, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Young Yi, uh, if you could come up, I was just curious. You know, knowing now that under current law, that if a candidate requests, they could get approval for child care expenses under current campaign finance law. Um, were you aware of that? Uh, no, I was not aware of no. that. Uh, however, uh, passing measures such as this make it clear. Uh, and I, I fully get that. But yeah. What I'm just saying is I wanted to emphasize that even if we can't get this through, we tried this mm -hmm. before, and we'll try. If, if the committee agrees to what we'll we, try we again. could definitely do public education but if that's out. what you're getting at. Yeah, but uh, it would be really nice to have a measure like this okay. passed to make sure. it clear to the public that this is possible. And I want to thank our representative uh, Ta Takayama for pointing out that this is also for kupuna care as well, because often they are in the famous sandwich generation, right? Sure. Sure. Yeah. yeah, we're all, all right. taking care of our elderly parents. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Anyone else wishing to testify? If not, we'll move on. Thank you very much to all the testifiers. We're moving on to Senate Bill 2216 relating to the State Ethics Commission. This measure clarifies and modernizes the way the State Ethics Commission provides advice and conducts investigations. First up, we have testimony from Robert Harris, Executive Director, Hawaii State Ethics Commission. Welcome, sir. Please proceed. Aloha, Chair, Vice Chair, and Representative Miyaki. The Ethics Commission is in strong support of this measure. Just briefly, the Ethics Commission prioritizes doing education, advice, receiving financial disclosure statements, and doing enforcement. Our emphasis has always been if we do a better job on the education and advice, we can reduce the need to do an enforcement. Uh, the Ethics Commission currently has an attorney of the day, which it, we generally very much solicit people calling us and inquiring for advice, uh, and on average receive about 40 uh, or so requests for advice per month. This bill helps codify and ensure that those communications are confidential. We want to make sure that people feel comfortable in revealing the circumstances that they're calling about and what they're exploring so we can kind of explore with them uh, appearances of impropriety or the application of the state ethics code. And so this helps ensure that that communication remains confidential, and that's why, in part, this is a uh, priority bill. In addition, it helps codify our current standards on investigation, which has already been established either by way of um, decisions, court decisions or otherwise, but by putting a statute, we hope it will make it more obvious to folks who are looking at it to understand how the investigation process works. Um, one last thing, this also allows us to issue an advisory opinion. We already have that mechanism, but generally speaking, someone has to request it specifically, and it's a more formal process. This would allow us to issue uh, advisory opinions as to general matters. So if we receive the same question 10 times, say, we can say this is ripe for an advisory opinion, just basically put it out there and give people the force and effect of law that they can rely upon that going forward. Thank you again for the opportunity to testify. I'm available for any questions you might have. Thank you very much. Uh, that's all we have uh, wanting to testify in this measure. Is anyone else here or online wishing to testify? Please go ahead, Mr. Hurt. 
Cameron Hurt, Common Cause of Hawaii, in support. We um, testified on this bill when it was in the Senate, but I um, just wanted to reiterate that we are in strong support of this bill. Any bill that is going to allow our election commission to run, how we see this bill is more efficiently, um, definitely with being able to give gen um, more generalized opinions so people can see those and not have to worry about calling in or getting a response or how quickly that is. Also, um, you know, codifying the processes for the um, ethics commission is um, always a, a a key characteristic of good governance, so common causes and strong support. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else wishing to testify on this measure? If not, questions, members? Seeing none, we'll move on to the next measure. Thank you to the testifiers. Senate Bill 2217 relating to reporting periods. This measure adjusts the reporting period for gift disclosures filed with the State Ethics Commission to conform with the fiscal year and provides for electronic filing of documents required by the Ethics Commission. First up, we have Robert Harris, Hawaii State Ethics Commission. Thank you, Chair, Vice Chair. The Ethics Commission is in support of this measure. I would call this a housekeeping measure. Uh, it lines the reporting period for most state employees with the fiscal year, uh, and it unfortunately has to go through a somewhat convoluted process to handle that transition. That's why it's wordier than you think it should be. Uh, available if you have any questions. Thank you very much. Thank you. Anyone else wishing to testify on this measure? If not, questions, members? Seeing none, we'll move on. Thank you. House Bill 2219, relating to lobbying. This measure amends the definition of lobbying to include communications regarding procurement decisions with certain high-level government officials, establishes certain presumptions regarding testimony when given by a paid person, and it makes certain contracts voidable when entered into in violation of lobbying law. First up, we have Mr. Harris, Vice State Ethics Commission. Aloha, Chair, Vice Chair, members of the committee. Uh, the Ethics Commission is also in support of this bill. I will largely rely on a written testimony, but I'll summarize for purposes of anybody who is listening. Uh, this is a critical and important um, expansion of the lobbying law to include procurement interactions. Generally speaking, this is going to be pre-procurement. -pre so outside of the procurement process where there may be interactions over a proposed contract, a sale of something, where there are interactions that might really influence this. Um, this bill is modeled on other jurisdictions. The intent really is where potentially millions of dollars of public money are being spent to try to have more transparency of the communications going on with regards to that. Um, we have uh, worked with the State Procurement Office, and we've worked with some uh, individual folks involved in the procurement process to try to resolve some of the concerns and to try to make sure this is a um, process that can work. We've also proposed a fairly extensive enactment date in order to be able to have the opportunity to do proactive education and to make sure we're able to resolve concerns before this goes into effect. We um, appreciate your attention to this. Again, we think this would be a bold step, and it has the potential to really avoid um, waste fraud, and other concerns generally with the expenditure of state money. We appreciate your attention to this and are available for any questions you might have. Thank you. And we've received testimony in, in, with comments in support and in opposition from numerous individuals uh, to this measure. Uh, one, one person with comments, one person in support, and eight testimonies in opposition. Is there anyone else wishing to testify on this measure? Mr. Toyofuku, welcome. Please proceed. Uh, Mr. Chairman and members, Bob Toyofuku, <clears throat> I'm testifying as an individual and, <clears throat> excuse me, is regarding this bill, not supporting or opposing, but, uh, and my apologies, I really started looking at this at the at the last minute, and I'll submit written testimony. My one concern I had, and, and maybe Mr. Harris or the committee can clarify it, there is a provision here that, and I understand what he's talking about, communicating with any person identified in Section 84-17, that's the procurement section, and it says concerning the solicitation or award. There are times, and in that 84-17 is the um, administrative director of the courts. And there are times when I am dealing with the administrative director because they have asked me uh, not, 
well, as an individual, but through my 501c3 to do something for the judiciary. So if I get an award or a contract, I'm not too clear on whether I have to register as a lobbyist as president of my 501c3. You know, I mean, I got a little confused on that. And the other point that I just wanted to raise for the committee's consideration is that, you know, the 10 uh, testimonies per calendar year, depending upon who it applies to, it could become a problem. But I assume, like in the tobacco-free Hawaii uh, situation where you have a lot of students testifying, and some may testify more than 10 times a year. But I'm assuming that the current law, which says you have to either be paid or expect payment or consideration, and I don't think the students do, so it doesn't apply to them, or I hope it doesn't apply to them. Otherwise, some of them are testifying more than 10 times. So I just wanted to point those things out. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Toyofuku. Anyone else wishing to testify? If not, questions, members? Mr. Harris, could I ask you to come up, please? We heard in testimony uh, a, a couple of scenarios that uh, would benefit from your explanation. Would you uh, care to comment on those? I, I would, and thank you for the opportunity, Chair. I appreciate it. If I may briefly explain the 10 testimonies, just to make sure that that is addressed, because I suspect some of the opposition may be coming from that language. Uh, in a prior version of the bill, um, it has always been the standard that a lobbyist is someone who is paid on behalf of another to testify and a certain level of, or to lobby on a bill, a certain amount of de minimis interactions were allowed, so up to five hours in a month or 10 hours in a year. One of the challenges has been is trying to determine, well, have they gone past that five hours in a month or 10 in a year? And so there was a proposed presumption that, again, if you were paid on behalf of another and you've submitted testimony more than 10 times, you've probably exceeded that five or 10 hours. And the idea is to create an objective bright line standard. So it was really no relative change to the existing lobby law. It was just basically a, uh, a threshold th you know, thumbnail sketch of this is an objective bright line. You've probably gone past the five or 10 hours. You're being paid on behalf of another. A number of people looked at that and thought that may apply to just anyone submitting testimony, like public citizens. Plainly, there's a First Amendment right to submit testimony. They're not lobbyists. They're not being paid by someone else. Because of the confusion over that, we asked that that language be stricken, just simply, it's not being understood. Let's just take it out. It's not vital to the overall purpose of the bill. So that is not what we're asking for. And if this moves forward, it's not in the current draft, and we wouldn't ask it to be brought back in. Um, specific to the example of interactions with the judiciary, uh, this bill also specifically excludes interactions where government reaches out, a, a state employer or something saying, I'd like to learn more about a certain area, I'd like to learn more before we issue an RFP. The idea we want to allow government officials to educate themselves. Where this would kick in is if, for example, somebody were the head of a 501c3 or a business or something, and they're affirmatively reaching out, they're being paid, they're employed, they're a business, and they go past that five hours of interaction time. And the idea is, for example, if somebody's going in and saying, here's a proposed RFP you should look at, here are standards you should look at, those may not be in the best interest of the state. And the idea is just to make some public transparency to the fact that that entity is reaching out and eff effectively asking for a contract or something to be issued, that competitors in the field or others looking back can say, hey, wait, wait, there's probably more that should be disclosed here. And that, that's the intent here. Um, I can say from personal experience, uh, we had one vendor give us proposed standards, and when we looked at it, we eventually were able to determine that the, they were proposing standards that only they could meet, no other vendor could meet. That's a type of example where that's not in the state's best interest by doing looser standards that still met the needs that our agency needed. Other vendors were able to bid at a much lower price. And it's just one small example of what we hope some level of transparency here will help um, have happen. Thank you for Thank the opportunity you. to follow up. And uh, another question for you. Um, if someone were, if a company were to have a contract with HFTC or something, HHFTC, um, and uh, 
they are in communication with members of HS, HHFTC or, or staff um, uh, on a different project, would, and would they have to be registered as a lobbyist? So the current definition is if it's within the procurement process itself, so if, uh, pr proposed interactions. Let's say it's pre-procurement. It's, pre it's, you know, they, they already have a contract with, with the organization on another project, but they're in the business of building, you know, construction projects or whatever. And so they're in communication with them about a potential future project, but it's not in procurement yet. Um, because they're talking about specifications, they're talking about whatever they talk about in construction industry. Uh, would that company or that individual have to register as a lobbyist? If it was more than five hours and, and accumul cumulatively, yes, I think that would be a good example. Oh. Interactions on the current contract would not apply, right. but if you're talking about something new and unique, the opportunities to give other vendors, other inter, uh, interested parties, potentially transparency into the fact that those interactions are occurring. If the agency were to one were to be the one to initiate the contact with uh, the private company to ask them questions about things regarding a project that is not yet in procurement, if it was initiated by the agency, not by the company, right. would those interactions count toward the threshold of having to register as a lobbyist? Uh, currently under statute, no, those are exempt. I suspect with time, we'd probably have to issue guidance to try to clarify that. For example, if the agency reaches out and then the interactions keep going over time, you could see that perhaps at some point the interaction has become vague enough that now you're just having back and forth interactions. I suspect over time rules or something trying to clarify would be necessary. But right now, the way it's drafted is that the reach out by the agency would not count. The idea is we want agencies to feel comfortable to reach out and do inquiries as need be. Okay. And uh, you said from your previous comments that this would not apply to members of the public who send in testimony. They're not being paid. Absolutely not. Okay. Um, if, if an individual who sends in testimony is uh, with an organization that has a contract with the state, but they're testifying on other things, and they're not getting paid for their testimony, would they have to register as a lobbyist? If it's separate and apart from the contract, no. Uh, if it's in their personal capacity, for example, then no, they would not have to. If they're testifying as part of the organization, let's say they're with uh, uh, a nonprofit that provides human services, social services, and uh, they have a contract with the state, and they're wanting to testify on bills that relate to uh, you know, family services and uh, programs related to that. And uh, would they have to register as a lobbyist? Currently, um, outside of the procurement, so it's just current lobbying law today, if somebody is employed by a nonprofit and they're submitting testimony, um, and I, I should say, not, not to the legislature, because you've got that covered, but to an agency. If they're writing letters on proposed rules or something like that, would they have to register as a lobbyist? Currently, proposed rules is already within the lobbying law, that that would be something that would trigger the lobbying statute already. So that, if that it's is, not proposed rules, but it's, it's let's say, uh, an organization or an agency is contemplating a new program, and the nonprofit who's an expert in that area was was talking to the agency about this new program. That's not yet set up, they're just putting it together. So it's not formal rulemaking, it's not the legislature. At what point does that become lobbying? So uh, again, uh, assuming this were to pass, the interaction would have to be with regards to procurement or something in within, within the procurement realm. So if there's interactions outside of that that was not related to admin rules, procurement, or legislation, then that would not count as lobbying. So if, if it were a new program that their agency is contemplating that might include procurement of uh, you know, contracted services for the new program, then that could fall within this Correct. scope of this bill? 
Correct. I think to the extent that that communication is already public, so for example, a public forum, public hearing, that's probably not something necessarily that we would say should be swept up, but currently it would be swept up as within the definition of a lobbyist. Okay. Well, I appreciate having to talk about these scenarios because I've just been getting questions from other members about this with concern. Uh, they're saying, boy, this, this could really hobble free flow of, of communication. Um, and people might have to register as a lobbyist and they never imagined they would have to do something like that. Sure. Again, I think the fundamental definition of being paid to testify on behalf of another is still the fundamental uh, basis of it, and that hasn't changed. And we frequently take the attitude that there's no such thing as good or bad lobbying. In fact, it's fundamental to the operation of government that people with expertise come forth. So we don't necessarily see any bad perception with being defined as a lobbyist. It's, it's no, perfectly I, fine. Just I, the idea is transparency. I get it. You, you just need them to register and fill out the forms. It's not that you're judging them good or bad. Correct. Yeah, I, I got that. Um, it's just um, appreciate you talking through some of these scenarios because I got an answer to some of the other members who are questioning this bill. So, okay, thank you very much. Any other questions, members? Representative Ganadin. I'm, I'm concerned about the practice of law here. Um, I'm just, in the entire paragraph, starting with line eight, um, presumption of lobbying, it seems like you're just describing um, the work that many attorneys and law firms do here in the state to get information, to advocate for their clients, and, and they do so with confidentiality. Um, the notion that they uh, would be, um, I don't want to say exposed, but like uh, be um, put on a list for their advocacy, the practice of law it just strikes me as odd. Um, any, any comments on that? I, I guess, again, I have to go back to the fundamental de definition of what a lobbyist is. It would have to be with respect to legislation or admin rule currently, and that's already the standard. So interaction by a lawyer interacting on anything that's not legislation or is just, it's not within the definition of lobbying. Or a forthcoming contract? I mean, because the next paragraph is contracts voidable. So that that puts into jeopardy the very work of um, hiring counsel to, uh, let's say you're one of the many developers here in the state, or the Department of Hawaiian Homelands, or um, um, any one of the counties, and you want to get more information and advocate for the work on a project. Um, you have to you have to sign up as a lobbyist now instead of just being a lawyer. If somebody is reaching out affirmatively, let's just say a hundred million dollar bridge, and saying, "Hey, I really have the proprietary technology. You really should write the contract in a way where it really gets this technology or these benefits." The idea is that that is something that, for transparency reasons, other jurisdictions have done this as well. It's not unique. That is something you want to have transparency on because somebody else may say that's actually not a standard you need and it's going to cost the state a lot more money. So that is really fundamentally what we're trying to capture is those interactions outside of the procurement process, essentially pre, where the decision maker may be being influenced in a way to make it in such a way that's not necessarily in the best interest of the state. So in this example, a lawyer representing a contractor approaching DHHL and saying, well, here's really the way you should do that sewage project. Yeah, again, it's not going to require... Well, sometimes DHHL has their own attorneys. Um, they've had, they have in the past. They've had to hire outside counsel. Um, again, if it's their own... That, it's specifically exempt from lobbying if it's their own counsel or someone working on behalf of the state. The uh, really focus here would be, again, somebody who's trying to get that procurement to happen in a certain way or a certain manner. Well, and again, if it's a lawyer... Sorry. Uh, I mean, of, of course they're, they're trying to... to um, advocate zealously for their client pursuant to the ethics, you know, as outlined under the Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. um, why add another level of, of oversight from an entirely different branch of government? Again, the intent here is specifically for transparency. I'm not sure that other competitors legislators or others are aware that those communications are going on. And for you, for example, in a legislative role, 
to have confidence that the executive branch is making decisions in the best interest of the state, to have some public visibility into um, what sales pitches have been made, who's been having those interactions, and who's been trying to influence that ultimate decision process. And so, yes, it is another layer, but the idea is it's just transparency. Do you think this presumption of compensation is gonna, um, that, uh, are, you, are you okay with this presumption of, this presumption that's based in here? I mean, obviously you are. But uh, do you think that attorneys might might take uh, take some umbrage with with this presumption here? So that presumption, just to be clear, uh, is motivated from a situation where you might have someone who works for a nonprofit who's doing advocacy, um, who will say essentially, "Well, I'm not paid to do the advocacy." And so therefore, I'm not a lobbyist. And so the intent was to basically say, look, if you are advocating on the same things that are related to your nonprofit, that your nonprofit's pushing or promoting, we're gonna make the presumption, again, it's a presumption, it can be rebutted, that a part of your compensation, your salary, is for this purpose. And so the idea is to try to make that easier or cleaner to basically say, look, we're not gonna start trying to parse what parts of paychecks go to what functions that you're doing, and the idea is to combine that. Again, with respect to a lawyer, um, I, you know, I'm not sure that's gonna be as directly applicable because what they're being paid for, generally speaking, for is going to be the actions that they're doing. We, I don't think it's gonna be as likely for them to say, hey, I'm just doing all this interaction in my own personal capacity. Well, one more, sure. Yes. I'm, I'm just seeing all kinds of poss possibilities here. Uh, one of the big ones that's coming up in my mind is, um, uh, um, the workers at the University of Hawaii who've been attempting to unionize now for the better part of a decade, really, in mm -hmm. their cases before the Supreme Court, um, they sh have been showing up here at the, to the legislature with regularity. Um, they're arguing that they're not compensated appropriately. Um, they're arguing against the University of Hawaii. Mm -hmm. um, could it be presumed that they're receiving compensation from the organization, let's say the uh, the um, the graduate student union that they're attempting to organize, we're, we're attempting that they're getting compensated from that? They would still have to be compensated from the graduate student union in this example. So they're, but you're, we're presuming they're, we're presuming compensation The, pres now. the presumption, the, with, again, maybe the language um, could use tightening. The intent is to say that that compensation that they do receive, if it is benefiting the entity, is related to the lobbying. So it prevents a situation, just hypothetically speaking, an executive director from an organization coming in and saying, yes, I receive lots of money from my organization, but when I'm here, I'm in my own personal capacity, even though everything I'm testifying is related to that nonprofit. Does that make sense? I, I, so, so the intent isn't to presume compensation. If there's no compensation whatsoever, that cuts out the definition of law being. Then it, it's, but that's not defined here in the law. It says receiving compensation, and then there's no uh, SB1 to define that later on in the document, not that I see. So, I mean, are you... Com compensation are you is already defined within the lobbyist law, and the definition of lobbyist is also already defined as someone who does receive compensation. Okay. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you. Any other questions? If not, thank you very much. I appreciate it. And again, if there are other questions, I, I recognize you said other people are having questions. Yeah. We're happy to interact in any way we can help. Okay, yeah, I appreciate that. We'll, we, we'll likely have to do that. <laughs> okay, next measure, Senate Bill 2569, SD2, relating to workplace safety. This measure allows a person who employs or contracts or contracts with health, a healthcare worker who suffers an act of violence at the healthcare facility to report the event to law enforcement and petition for a temporary restraining order in, in and injunction under certain circumstances. On this measure, <clears throat> we have the Office of the Public Defender. Thank you for your patience. Please proceed. Thank you, and um, good afternoon, Chair, Vice Chair, members of the committee, Alan Nicole, Deputy Public Defender. Um, our office is testifying um, in opposition to this uh, particular bill, um, highlights uh, noting the 
special classification given this authorizes uh, employers for healthcare workers specifically. I'm not sure, um, as noted, um, it's not creating a special class of offense tailored to them. Um, we'll also note that they're already authorized. Any person, any witness to um, any type of violence um, can call the police and report um, an incident. Um, and then we think it takes it a, a step too far, um, and that's by also giving them um, kind of a, um, a special employer-employee condition in which they can now file temporary restraining orders on the um, person, the employee, or a contract worker's behalf. Again, we don't think it's really necessary since that person um, can do it on their, by their, themselves. And in a temporary restraining order petition, um, it usually asks pretty personal questions. Um, so um, the courts don't usually take up um, the, the petitioner um, being petitioned on behalf of somebody else. Um, the respondents can be, um, but for the petitioner themselves to not be the, the person, the move on essentially, um, draw some concerns. And then lastly, um, we are uh, deeply concerned with the uh, reference to allowing the employer, if they were to um, file a temporary restraining order on behalf of uh, an employee or a contract worker, um, that it would uh, uh, this bill would provide for cost for them. Um, so they could seek incentive um, for um, protecting their um, employees or employers uh, without essentially um, covering the cost of legal counsel, um, which we find unusual. So um, for those reasons, our office submits testimony in opposition. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. Next, we have testimony with comments from the Hawaii Primary Care Association. Uh, and for those who haven't had a chance to read it, um, HPCA is concerned that the enactment of this bill would expand the liability exposure of health care employers. Uh, while the bill explicitly provides certain immunities for actions taken by the employer, such as filing a report to law enforcement or petitioning for a temporary restraining order, it is unclear whether liability would extend to the employer if the employer chooses not to act. And would the failure to act demonstrate the employer's lack of good faith? And one could argue that if this law was enacted, an employer, for whatever reason, chooses not to file a report or petition for a TRO, and subsequently an act of violence occurs against an employee, that employer would fail to provide a safe work environment for employees as required under federal and state labor and occupational laws, which would have the practical effect of increasing their liability. So uh, next we have testimony from Waianae Coast Comprehensive Health Center. You came in just on time. Uh, thank you very much. I was watching the TV just outside. Aloha Chair, Vice Chair, members of the committee. We're um, really honored for this opportunity to testify in favor of SB 2569. Uh, this bill came up through conversations with our employees. Uh, the Waianae Coast Comprehensive Health Center, along with many health centers across the United States, are facing unprecedentedly high levels of violence. Um, by some measures, according to the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics, 63% of workplace violence or uh, time off due to injuries or illness due to injuries workplace violence are, are in health centers. So when we hear about a carve out for like a type of employer who are allowed to do this, if you were to ever make one, I think the case is strong that we're the ones to do that for. But, you know, as I've said from the beginning in meetings with uh, legislators, uh, I do believe, and we wouldn't have been opposed to, allowing all employers. That's a direction that many states have chosen to do. We spoke as employers of a health center because we are, we are a health center. Um, but multiple states, I believe 10 and counting, allow for employers to file temporary restraining orders. This includes Arkansas, California, and numerous others. California in the last year actually took the unprecedented step to extend this, to allow unions to actually go out and file temporary restraining orders for their employees. Now, why does this matter? We've see, statistics are increasingly coming out on the national level that show that one of the drivers and one of the reasons that people are leaving the healthcare profession, especially in careers like nursing, is due to uh, risk, injury, and workplace violence. We know that this makes it harder for us to care. Health centers are about assisting the communities. And so I'm really proud to be supporting a bill which then helps those who help the communities. 
Uh, one example I want to give is that one of our doctors decided to uh, pursue filing a TRO, and he had to end up taking three separate shifts off to go to the courts and navigate the system and fill out the pa paperwork. And those were three shifts that could have been going towards serving one of the most underserved communities in Hawaii. So we believe that allowing our security or our HR to get the special uh, specialization, learn how to navigate these systems, and do it on behalf of employees helps. To kind of close that circle a little bit, one of the issues is that um, we as an employer are required to make sure our workplace is safe. And we are concerned about legal responsibilities for not having all of the tools in the toolbox to do that. So this would just be one more tool. And for those reasons, I'm very happy to support this measure. Thank you all so much for your time. Thank you very much. Uh, we've got testimony and support from two other individuals. Is there anyone else wishing to testify on this measure, Senate Bill 2569? If not, questions, members? I have a question for Mr. Ross. Um, in reading the testimony from the Hawaii Primary Care Association, which I excerpted uh, for mm -hmm. us here, uh, have you been in conversations with them and about this whole issue of uh, their concern of, of uh, increasing liability for the employer? That's a really good question. Um, so my understanding for the bill, and I thought that was a very interesting articulation on there, was that the waiver was on both ends of filing or not filing. And that was what we had been advocating before. Uh, we periodically check in with them as we are a member uh, as in a federally qualified health center. And so I was actually intending to follow up with them right after this hearing. I would urge you to do that, yeah, thank you. Um, especially if you were saying that uh, you said California and other states yes. have something like this. That's right, but they do it for all employers. And again, we argued for the carve out in our right. case just because that's what we're representing. Okay, well, we, I mean, there's enough m members that I've spoken to that are concerned about this, especially in light of the testimony that came in, mm -hmm. that maybe that conversation needs to happen before we can take action on it. But I, I'm glad you're gonna follow up right away. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Any other questions, members? No, nope, let's not. If not, we'll move on. Thank you very right, thank much. Thank you very much. Senate Bill 2561 relating to animal endangerment. This measure prohibits intentionally leaving or confining pet animals in a vehicle under conditions that endanger their health, safety, or well being. Permits law enforcement officers, animal control officers, and firefighters to enter an unattended vehicle to protect the health, safety, or well being of a pet animal that is endangered by being left or confined in, a, in an untended vehicle. It allows private citizens to rescue a pet animal that has been left in an unattended vehicle under certain circumstances. And this measure we have first up, uh, the Attorney General. Welcome, thank you for your patience. Please proceed. Good afternoon, Chair Tarnas, members of the committee. Uh, my name is Dep Deputy Attorney General Elise Oyama from the Criminal Justice Division. As noted in our testimony, we just offer our comments. Uh, we note that there is currently a subsection under animal cruelties in the second degree, which covers a similar type of offense already. There are benefits to what we already have in statute that make it easier to prosecute, um, such as the state of mind, as well as that it doesn't just limit itself to pet animals confined in vehicles. Um, so we recommend removing that section. We also recommend removing the remaining sections into chapter 708, which relates to property, and I'll be available for any questions. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next, we have testimony from the public defender. And thank you again, and good afternoon, uh, Chair, Vice Chair, members of the committee, Deputy Public Defender Alan Nicole. On behalf of the Office of the Public Defender, um, we are offering our um, opposition to this particular bill. Um, our Madam Attorney General did cover um, our, our biggest, uh, one of the biggest issues we find with the bill um, is that essentially it's uh, calling for uh, the same, uh, a similar offense under a similar statute. Uh, so basically it's already been um, consumed within um, the already existing animal cruelty and the second degree um, uh, subsection of the uh, Hawaii Vice Statutes uh, 711, 1109. So that carve out we think is already uh, covers that offense. Um, but we also see that it's doing additional things. Um, so um, again, we believe the intent of um, you know the safety and, and welfare of, of our uh, state's animals is, is um, a good intentions, um, but it adds additional things. Uh, we believe that there is uh, quite a bit of issue with um, the, we understand that the, the 
one of the goals is for immunity for essentially either um, law enforcement, uh, fire, um, emergency services, or even uh, a good Samaritan. But um, when you look at the uh, way in which the, um, the bill uh, defines the certain terms in which um, these persons are making these judgment calls, um, it's a little too discretionary, um, and it doesn't really give good guidance as to um, circumstances in which are considered reasonable, is considered good faith. Those are more legal terms. So for Good Samaritans, um, you know, we don't believe at this time that it's going to be, um, it's too suggestive. Um, and then the last thing too is um, the ability for law enforcement because while it may be in lieu of a um, investigation or they believe that this is a suspect vehicle, something like that, um, the kind of fruits of what could come after the animal um, or the property is um, damaged or opened um, can lead to liability that could lead to legal searches. Um, so we don't want to cross onto that line particularly. So for that reason, we uh, do understand and support the intent of um, immunity for the liability for both civil and criminal purposes, but um, the inclusion of a new um, misdemeanor offense as well as the um, other issues with um, post-rescue operations are um, complicated. So for those reasons, we oppose this bill as written. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, next, we have testimony from the Hawaii Association for Justice. And we have testimony from the Hawaiian Humane Society, for Angel Foundation, Animal Legal Defense Fund, and four individuals. Is there anyone else wishing to testify in Senate Bill 2561? Seeing none, questions, members? If not, we'll move on. Thank you. Two, Senate Bill 2236, relating to law enforcement. This requires law enforcement to post notice that a warranted or warrantless search has been conducted on a property. On this measure, we have testimony from the public defender. And thank you again, and good afternoon, uh, Chair, Vice Chair, members of the committee, Deputy Public Defender Alan Kyle. Um, our office is uh, just uh, providing support for this bill. Uh, we believe that um, it doesn't um, prevent or cause uh, law enforcement to do anything other than provide proper notice after these things are done. So we believe in their investigative powers and in their enforcement powers that um, this is something that uh, speaks to um, good investigation and um, adherence to um, our, the spirit of our state constitution. So we stand in support of this bill. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next we have Mr. Crossland. Anyone else wishing to testify on Senate Bill 2236? Sure, come on up. Take your time and introduce yourself. Okay. My name is uh, Glenn Murray, and this is my bill, my story, my journey. On November 5th, 2021, three police officers entered and searched my apartment without a warrant. It was a warrantless search. And they left and they failed to secure my door. I found out about this incident two weeks later from my next door neighbor. So what I did is uh, I accessed our um, video surveillance footage and it confirmed that the officers did enter my unit while I was away. Um, then I filed the OI, through the UIPA, I filed a request for records, chapter 92F21, chapter 92F23, to HPD records. Uh, they came back with a reply that no records or reports existed. So I enlisted the help of the OIP staff attorney, Lori Cotto, and with her dedication, persistence, and perseverance, she was able, two months later, to get records, reports, and body cam from HPD. So the intent of this bill is that when officers, law enforcement officers, enter our residence when nobody is at home and conduct a search and maybe even a seizure, we ask them to post notice of this incident. And this, the intent also is to promote honesty, forthrightness, and transparency. 
And this will develop trust between the law enforcement, the people and law enforcement agencies, which we need in our fight on crime. The people deserve dignity, respect, and courtesy. And please respect our local customs, values, and ways. And an important item too is uh, please take off your shoes when you enter our residence. Um, in conclusion, um, you know, for me personally, it affected my health. It gave me high anxiety, stress, and sleepliness, sleeplessness, which I was prescribed medication. I don't want to see anybody else have to go through my experience, my journey. It's just a simple, it's just a simple bill. That's, uh, thank you. I appreciate that, sir. Um, could I, uh, I'm going to ask Janine to come over and get your uh, name so we can make sure that's part of the record. I appreciate you coming in, sir. Senate Bill 2236, anyone else wishing to testify on this measure? If not, questions, members? Representative Ganadin. Officer of the Public Defender. Good afternoon, sir. Yes. Um, I'm surprised to not see more testimony for or against this bill. Um, uh, two years ago, um, there was some discussion here at the legislature regarding uh, warrantless no-knock searches. Um, can you explain to the committee the legal justification for officers to enter into a residence without a warrant? So, um, as was previously stated, so the intent of this bill, my understanding, isn't to justify warrantless knock and uh, search and seizures. Um, this is just saying that if it was to be done, the importance is to give notice to the residents or of the unit or the owner um, that uh, such a search was conducted. So we're in, we are in strong opposition to the um, use of no knock, no uh, warrantless searches. Um, but we're just saying that in this particular bill, uh, we believe the intent is to ensure that um, when searches are done, whether warrantless, knock or announce, and at uh, all times, good transparency is to know, to have record of it and to post notice, especially if the owner occupant is not present at the time the search is conducted. So, well, yeah. How it, op how it works now, it's, uh, somebody could return to their residence, and if a search was conducted, the door could, and gate could be open. Correct. Your cats could be flying all over the neighborhood. Correct. Um, you would have no idea if you were uh, actually trespassed upon, or like there's a breaking and entering, or Correct. It, it would just be no record? Yep, correct. So HPD, um, any investigation, um, especially those in which um, they feel like there's exigent circumstances to um, either a crime or a suspicious activity that's ongoing, um, you know, they're authorized by law to um, make discretionary decisions whether or not they're going to enter a residence. Now, in circumstances in which they don't have those things, uh, say a search warrant specific for that per per particular unit or property, um, they can still enter the property. Now, if their search or their, there's no seizure, um, it's still HPD policy that they file a report, but the owner occupant doesn't get notice of that, right? So they might, there's no, there's no one to give notice or give that report to unless upon request. So the person would have to know through some other tenant, through some other person giving them notice that, hey, HPD entered into your property. So without, so there's reports that can be generated, but if nothing led to it, there's no follow-up report, there's no seizure of items, there's no uh, record. Um, you know, really it comes down to whether or not our law enforcement is following the rules that is set aside by their own policies. So um, I understand the frustration and the intent um, is to call for more accountability and transparency um, and that HPD and any law enforcement adhere to that. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions, members? If not, that, thanks very much for all the test fires. Thank you, sir, for coming in. Uh, I know this is, uh, absolutely. Uh, we, we always do better when we hear from advocates uh, uh, or people with concerns about a bill, and this has personal interest for you, so I appreciate you taking the time to come in. 
Okay, let's go to the final bill, Senate Bill 2958, relating to statutory revision, amending or repealing various provisions of the Hawaii Revised Statutes or the Session Laws of Hawaii for the purposes of correcting errors and references, clarifying language. Oh, oh, sorry, relating to owners of land. Senate Bill 2387, I jumped ahead. Second to last bill, Senate Bill 2387 relating to owners of land. This corrects erroneous references in Chapter 520 and 520A, Hawaii Revised Statutes. And we don't have any testimony on that. So let's now move to the final bill, Senate Bill 2958 relating to statutory revision, amending or repealing various provisions of the Hawaii Revised Statutes or the Session Laws of Hawaii for the purposes of correcting errors and references clarifying language or deleting obsolete or unnecessary provisions. On this measure, uh, Legislative Reference Bureau. Please proceed. Good afternoon, Chair. This is our annual bill to correct errors, omissions, or obsolete law. Uh, the changes are intended to be technical in nature. And I'll point out that prior to introduction, we submitted the bill to the AGs for review and they identified no problems. Thank you. And we have testimony from the Tax Foundation of Hawaii, Tom Yamachika, not present. Anyone else wishing to testify on this measure, Senate Bill 2958? If not, questions, members? I have one question for uh, LRB. Um, one of our staff members with a keen editorial eye found that the word title was not included before when referring to Title 52. Uh, I guess if in federal law, you always have to say Title 52 or Title whatever the number is, but the word title was not in the bill. Do you have the page number on that? Um, I do not, but I can get it. Um, and yeah, so, so, so it would depend on whether or not it was within the, the text proper or if it was within a parenthetical. So the this, this citation format is different if it's in a parenthetical versus the text. So okay. I'm going to see. Um, okay. I'm, um, I don't know if I can find that answer out, but in case it has to be fixed, I might want to recommend we move it out with technical amendments. Okay. Um, that if, it, if there is a problem, you can fix it. Yeah. If you want to have your uh, staff contact me, uh, I can work with them on it. Okay. Okay, great. Thanks. Any other questions, members? If not, thank you very much. Appreciate your diligence, Mr. Morsi. Uh, let's, with everyone here, uh, thank you. Let's move up to the top of the agenda and do decision making. Okay, first up, uh, we have Senate Bill 2381, Senate Draft 2, relating to public financing for candidates to, to elected office. I must admit that I was very concerned uh, about this bill after reading the testimony from the Campaign Spending Commission uh, who articulated that they would be in an impossible position of ensuring and upholding the transparency and integrity of the campaign finance process in this historic piece of campaign reform. Uh, and that they felt that, they, that as the bill is written now, it would not set us on the path for a successful program. Uh, basically that they do not have the capacity because the uh, appropriations and the positions were removed from the bill. So in my opinion, and I'm open to other suggestions and other opinions from the members here, but in my, my view, the bill as sent to us by the Senate is, is really fatally flawed. It does not have the necessary funding and positions needed to do the required work to prepare for the implementation of this comprehensive publicly financed election. And I think this bill is really misleading the public by asserting that it sets up a workable, comprehensive, publicly financed fin election campaign system. Uh, this bill does not accomplish this. This bill does not set up a workable, comprehensive, publicly financed campaign system. In addition, the bill sets up an unworkable system for verifying qualifying donor contributions, as we saw from the testimony from the county uh, clerk. Uh, there is also insufficient time for, in my view, for the Campaign Spending Commission and the county clerks to verify qualified donors. Uh, 
and then I was reviewing the minimum number of qualified donors and I, for each race, and I was evaluating it as expressed by a percentage of registered voters for each of those races. And it w the percentage was all over the place. It was 0.1% in, race, in some races. It was more than 1% in other races. It's very inconsistent. So there's no, no rhyme or reason for how that was set up. There's no mechanism to equally allocate limited funds to all qualified candidates. Um, and as I said during some of the questions, uh, I've been approached by members uh, of our body that were concerned that the state would be paying for candidates running for county offices, and they didn't want to do that. They wanted the counties to pay for the publicly financed elections for people running for county offices. They even were saying that OHA should pay for their races, too. Um, so <clears throat> with all of these flaws, I really cannot in good conscience recommend that this committee approve this legislation. It needs a lot of work. Uh, we cannot compel future legislatures to appropriate funds. And that's what this bill is tacitly doing. We're setting up a program that would bind a future legislature to appropriate $30 million to implement the program. And it, it, while it might not violate the letter of the law and, uh, and uh, of our restrictions, I think it really gets close to violating certainly the spirit. And, and so I'm, I'm, I'm uh, with all these flaws, I just cannot in good conscience recommend that this committee approve the legislation. I'm gonna recommend we defer this. I'm open to your input. If you wanna give comments about this now, I'm not making this decision as an autocrat and dictating it. This was after discussions with many members. Um, and I don't make that recommendation lightly. We passed out of the publicly financed elections bill last session, and we moved it all the way to conference committee. We gave it a good chance. Um, but I think that I don't wanna mislead the public. And so I'm recommending we defer this. I'm open to your comments now. Uh, so I, let me open it up, any comments or concerns? I have comment. Representative Souza. Thank you, Chair, for your due diligence on this measure, and I fully support your decision to defer this measure. I agree with the Executive Director of the Campaign Spending Commission in that um, I support the spirit of this measure like she does, um, but I also think that the nuances <coughs> of this program needs to be worked out further, and also that we need to provide the Campaign Spending Commission with the proper resources for them to actually implement the program. So thank you for your work and I fully support your decision to defer this measure. Thank you, Representative. Other comments or concerns? Representative Holt. Um, thank you, Chair. I also do um, appreciate your recommendation on this measure. You know, our, two of our former colleagues keep being brought up about, you know, uh, their violations. Um, this would not prohibit that. They, they committed some very serious violations and even if this was in place, this not, would not have stopped it. So, you know, I, I don't think that's fair to say that something like this would stop that kind of corruption. Um, I also don't think that, you know, the funding amount that would take to completely fund uh, this program to be fair for everybody is something that we're in a position to be putting out there for the taxpayers right now. Um, you know, they say $30 million, but by my math, it would be probably closer to 50 to $60 million. And, you know, with the financial constraints that we currently have, I do appreciate um, the deferral at this point. So thank you. Thank you. Representative Ichiyama. Thank you, Chair, for the recommendation. I support your recommendation. I think this bill has a lot of potential unintended consequences that need some more time to be revisited. So thank you for the recommendation. Thank you. Other comments or concerns? Members, Representative Ganadin. Uh, Chair, I, I agree with your recommendation. I think um, for the advocates, uh, I understand what you're doing and why you're doing it, and I agree with the intent of attempting to make clean elections and trying to remove money out of politics. I think it's going to be back to the drawing board. I also think that uh, there needs to be some real discussions with people who have run campaigns, run for office, uh, won, lost, and uh, the way accounting happens and the way you pay for elections here, um, the way that uh, you have to pay for mailers, um, banners, uh, um, other things that cost a lot of money. A lot of the things you think cost a lot of money uh, don't if you're a member of the public, if you've never run for office. Um, I think that this 
bill is the result of too many cooks in the kitchen um, and trying to please both advocates, elected officials at every level, and also comply with the law. It's just too messy. Thank you. Thank you very much. Other comments? Representative Evelyn. Yeah, thank you, Chair. I support your recommendation. I appreciate the, um, the work you did to um, look into this bill and, and try and figure out if there was a pathway forward this year and last session. Um, and, you know, I have some philosophical concerns with the program in general, but my biggest concern has always been cost, and I don't think we can pretend that this thing, we, we can't set up a program without allocating money to it. And as we have all this session, I think through all of our committees, been shedding bills that are costly given the fiscal constraints of the state right now, I don't think it would be prudent to try and allocate some money to this to stand it up, and it's certainly not prudent to pass this out without any money allocated. So I um, appreciate um, your recommendation today. Thank you. Other comments or concerns, members? Sure. Vice Chair Takeyama. Chair, I support your decision to defer this bill. I uh, agree with the uh, concerns expressed by some of our fellow members. $30 million is a great deal of money to be spending in any year. Um, and we can't make decisions in a vacuum. $30 million would more than pay for expansion of the Hawaii Promise Program, providing scholarships for every student to attend a four-year university. Um, it would almost pay for free breakfasts and, and lunches for every public student. So given those other concerns, given a, a host of um, needs in light of the um, Lahaina tragedy, I agree that this is not the year to consider passing this measure. Thank you. Thank you. Other comments or concerns, members? If not, thank you very much for your comments. I think this was indication of the will of this committee. So it's not just me as chair that's making the recommendation, and I appreciate everyone speaking out so that people will understand in the public uh, where we're coming from. So we shall defer Senate Bill 2381 SD2. Moving on, next bill, Senate Bill 3243, Senate Draft 1. On this measure, I would recommend we move this out with a House Draft 1. I would like to, to, to err on the side of uh, uh, caution uh, and um, delete foreign-influenced business entities. Um, you know, I don't want to uh, be in potential violation of the federal uh, act, um, and considering that there are some there's some litigation going on right now. Let's let that take its course. Let's just focus on uh, um, prohibiting uh, foreign entities and foreign uh, nationals from uh, um, making contributions. I'd like to incorporate the League of Women Voters amendments. Uh, I'd like to defect the effective date. Um, and I would like to, uh, in the uh, page 4, line 20 to 21, it appears that a few states and cities have enacted legislation, so I think I, I just need to update that statement so it's accurate. And make technical amendments and defect the effective date to the year 3000. Questions or concerns, members? Representative Gannadin. Um, Chair, I uh, support your efforts here. I, um, I think the term foreign influence would have sent this act straight to the courts. Um, I, and, and I'm not sure if it's necessary. Uh, it's already not legal for uh, foreign nationals to donate to campaigns. Um, so for that reason, I guess I'll just be voting with reservations. Understood. Thank you. Representative for, Souza. For the same reasons, reservations. Thank you. Thank you. Other questions or concerns, members? If not, Vice Chair for the vote. Voting on uh, SB 3243 SD1 with amendments. Um, noting the re reservations of Representatives Ganadin and Souza. Uh, Chair and Vice Chair vote aye. Representative Evslin? Aye. Representative Holt? Aye. Representative Ichiyama? Aye. Representative Villagan? Aye. Representative Kong? With reservations. Reservations for Representative Kong. Uh, Representative Miyake? Aye. Uh, Chair, your recommendation is adopted. Thank you. Senate Bill 2405 relating to campaign finance. Even while this is already allowed under current uh, statutes and rules, uh, as we're informed by the Campaign Spending Commission, I think there is some merit to putting this into statute so it's clear uh, that campaign, uh, 
candidate, election candidate, treasurer, candidate committees can use campaign funds for the candidate's child care and vital household dependent care costs under certain conditions. So I would like to move this out with technical amendments and defect the effective date, year 3000. Questions or concerns, members? If not, Vice Chair for the vote. Voting on Senate Bill 2405 with amendments. All members being present. Anyone with reservations? Noes. Your recommendation is adopted. Thank you. Senate Bill 2216, Senate Draft 1. I would like to move this out uh, by defecting the effective date, year 3000. Questions or concerns, members? If not, Vice Chair for the vote. Voting on Senate Bill 2216, SD1 with amendments. Uh, any reservations or noes? Recommendation is adopted. Thank you. Senate Bill 2217, relating to reporting periods. I'd like to move this out with technical amendments and defect the effective date, year 3000. Questions or concerns, members? If not, Vice Chair for the vote. Voting on Senate Bill 2217 with amendments. Any reservations or noes? Recommendations adopted. Thank you. Senate Bill 2219. There's enough questions about this from uh, members that uh, I'd like to defer this for now. We may be able to bring it back up uh, for decision making. It's a single referral, so I've got some time. Uh, but I will follow up with members who had those questions and urge them to be in touch with the uh, Director of the Ethics Commission on this to see if we can work it out. But um, there, we got some serious questions and concerns. So for, for now, we're going to defer this measure. Okay. Any questions or concerns, members? If not, thank you. We'll move on. Senate Bill 2569, relating to workplace safety. Um, I think that there's some real concerns in here that were brought up uh, by testifiers. Um, and while I appreciate uh, what the Wainike Comprehensive uh, Health Center wants to do, I am concerned about this placing employers in a position that they may have increased liability if, if they don't take action. Um, and I think it's, it's enough of an area that is raising concerns that I would uh, I'd like to defer this measure, and I would urge uh, uh, the uh, advocates to reach out to the uh, primary, uh, reach out to your uh, association um, to which you belong that also provided testimony, uh, so that uh, perhaps you could find uh, some consensus. Um, because uh, right now I'm just concerned that. Uh, you might be placing yourself in um, in a in a difficult situation. So I would urge uh, I would urge you uh, uh, the the YNI Coast Comprehensive Health Center to work with the Hawaii Primary Care Association, uh, and if you can come up with some agreement, come back and talk to me. But in the meantime, uh, we're going to defer this measure. Questions or concerns, members? Yes, Representative Gannadin. I'll try to be brief. Uh, Chair, about three, uh, either three years ago or two years ago, we increased criminal liability for individuals who um, um, have a violent act or, or even harass a healthcare worker. Uh, the, Mr. Ross is nodding his head. Um, also, uh, healthcare centers and hospitals around the world have increased security and reacted um, accordingly in result to the COVID crisis um, and the way the public handled the COVID crisis and other crises after that. I think that this bill is about two years too late. Um, and hopefully uh, um, uh, workplace standards in healthcare uh, facilities can kind of keep up with uh, the expectations of the community. Thank you. Thank you very much. Other questions or concerns, members? If not, we'll move on. Uh, this next uh, Senate Bill 2561, SD2, um, after hearing the testimony from the Attorney General, uh, I've got enough questions about this, uh, whether it's really necessary, so I would recommend we defer this measure. Questions or concerns, members? Okay, seeing none, let's move on. Senate Bill 2236, on this measure, I'd recommend we move this out with a um, defecting the effective date to year 3000 and uh, want to clarify the existing statutory language under subsection A as follows. Uh, it should read the officer charged with the warrant 
may enter the house, store, or other building designated as the place to be searched without demanding permission if the officer finds the house, store, or other building open. If the doors, gates, or other bars to the entrance are shut, the officer shall declare the officer's office and officer's business and demand entrance. If the doors, gates, or other bars to the entrance are not immediately open, the officer may break them. When entered, the officer may demand that any other part of the house or any closet or other closed place in which the officer has reason to believe the property is concealed may be open for the officer's inspection. And if, the refused, and if refused, the officer may break the doors, gates, or other bars to the entrance. So we're just changing some of the words around uh, to make them clear. Uh, the, the intent is still the same. Uh, but it just would be better crafted. So that's my recommendation. Defect the effective date to the year 3000. Questions or concerns, members? If not, Vice Chair for the vote. Voting on SB 2236-SD2 with amendments. Any reservations or no's? Recommendations adopted. Thank you. Senate Bill 2387 relating to owners of land. I think this is in good shape as it is. We can move it out as is. Questions or concerns, members? If not, Vice Chair for the vote. Voting on SB 2387, passing as is. Any members with reservations or no's? Recommendations adopted. Um, on the last bill, um, is uh, Mr. Um, Moore, Mr. Morsey, are you still there? Um, I, we did find, I'm here, Chair. okay, it's on pages one and two before the citations to federal law. Um, we were wondering if you needed to put the word title before 52. Yeah, but I checked it out, and yeah, you're correct. Title should be there. Okay. All right. So uh, thank you very much. So with that in mind, I would recommend we move out Senate Bill 2958 with technical amendments, because that would count as a technical amendment. And particularly, we would add the word title before 52, uh, pages 1 and 2. And any other technical amendments that you have, you could do that as well. Okay? Okay. Uh, that's my recommendation. Questions or concerns, members? If not, Vice Chair for the vote. Voting on Senate Bill 2958 with amendments. Any reservations or no's? Recommendations adopted. Thank you. There being no further business before this committee today, we are adjourned. <laughs>